everybody. Renault are a curious company, to say the least, aren't they? I don't think it's any exaggeration to say they've created some really fine pieces of mechanical engineering in their very long and storied past. But, like many Japanese companies of late, their interest in the exciting comes and goes like the British weather. Right about now, the entire car industry is not in a good place, and Renault really are pinning all their hopes on cars like this one, the Zoe. That and the apparently ever-expanding lesbian marketplace, which they've been catering towards a lot with their recent advertising campaigns. The Zoe is an interesting car because, on the face of it, there's nothing really particularly exceptional about it. In fact, you could say that the Twizy is the more remarkable car in the lineup, albeit a somewhat more niche product. The intent of the Zoe is evidently to be an electric car that you really can use every single day. And that is what this car's owner, Edward, does with it. In fact, he's about the only person that I know who's bought an electric car and has made a decision that I think is the right one. Because you see, he puts about 30,000 miles a year on this car, and his other vehicles are a nice 4-litre V8 Range Rover, and a 20-odd ton mobile crane. So this really fills the brief of economical transport for him. He can charge the car at home, and he lives far enough away from any petrol station that filling up a regular car could be reasonably inconvenient. The Zoe is reasonably small, being not quite a two plus two, but having room in here for four small people or three large ones. The boot isn't particularly big, but this newly facelifted car promises to be all that more appealing to the next generation of car buyers. So what exactly do you get for your money, and how much money are Renault asking? Well, that for me is where electric cars often fall down. Because this clearly is still a very expensive technology, on the face of it, what you get for your money isn't ever really an awful lot. For example, the base model of Zoe, the Play, is £27,000 for the 110 horsepower version, and in it you get things like windy rear windows, manual air conditioning, no parking sensors. It's all very basic. In fact, even this car, which is from the opposite end of the lineup, being a 135 horsepower GT line car, isn't exactly overflowing with technology. You've got a slightly larger touchscreen in here. This one's also got optional larger alloy wheels. There's a Winter Pack 2, which means you've got heated seat and steering wheel. There's a little bit of leather, although the rest of the cabinet appears to have been trimmed in what looks like the remains of a geography teacher. It certainly doesn't feel like the £33,000 worth of car that its RRP would dictate, and therein for many people lies the rub. The fact is, most buying these kind of cars are going to be doing so on a PCP deal, which limits their mileage, and therefore limits their savings. However, if for whatever reason you have decided that an electric car could be for you, should the Zoe be one that you buy? Well, maybe. There's quite a lot to like about the car, and you feel like you're sat relatively high in the car because, in fact, you are. Its proportions are fairly small, it's not very wide, but it is quite tall, and there's a battery pack under your bum, meaning that you are sat in quite an elevated driving position that you cannot change. It feels somewhat alien to me, I have to say. Material quality in here is generally fairly poor, but it's on a par with, I'd say, the Nissan Leaf. The Leaf being perhaps a, a little bit nicer in some areas, and not anywhere near as nice in others. The infotainment in this car, for example, is miles ahead of the Leaf. I would say is sort of neck and neck with the Kia, but nowhere near as fancy and as techy as a Tesla. Incidentally, a Tesla was a vehicle that was considered by Edward, but he decided he wanted a car that had a somewhat more traditional interior in it. And I think that's perfectly fine reasoning myself. The display in here is bright, clear, and very easy to read. This new generation of car, known otherwise as the ZE50, has quite a few changes in comparison with the outgoing ZE40. Now, in those, you could have a choice of different battery pack sizes, but now you've got only the one 52 kilowatt hour unit. That is smaller than you'd find in the Kia e Nero or the Soul EV, a lot smaller than you'd find in an Audi e tron, but Thanks to this car's reasonable electric economy, it gets pretty decent range. 
real world, anywhere from about 180 miles onwards, depending on the style of driving that you're doing. Remember, electric cars work backwards in comparison to combustion engine vehicles. They get their best fuel economy around town. On the motorway is where they're at their worst. And if you're looking for a long distance cruiser, I would say the extra range of the Soul EV or the E-Nero make those worthwhile propositions. The E-Nero in particular is also usefully larger and Kia do give a slightly longer warranty, being seven years and 100,000 miles versus the Renault's five and 100,000. There are other things that Renault do not give a standard, which I have to say do surprise me. Earlier Zoe models only gave you the sort of seven and a half kilowatt chargeability, what really would be termed a sort of slow or maybe even medium speed charge. You didn't have any fast charge capacity at all. Now with the quick charge variants of these, you can charge up to 43 kilowatts, which is about average for a fast charge point. Faster do exist, and something like the Kia or the Audi will be able to take advantage of those, but in practice, most fast charging points that I bump into have a limit of about 50 kilowatts for now. Now, I do expect that to change at some point in the near future. However, with the battery pack in this car being reasonably small, I don't think it's too much of an issue, especially when you consider this car is aimed, I think, more at the kind of town and country or, or city car user. This obviously isn't a vehicle meant for doing big, long journeys. Included in the price of a new Zoe is a wall charging point for your home, so you can get a reasonably quick charge into the car. Overnight, you should be able to fill the thing. However, one thing that Renault do not give a standard is a regular 13 amp charging adapter, which I think is very silly. To me, that should be considered a piece of essential, almost emergency equipment for any electric car user. I know an awful lot of people talk about, well, what happens if you go somewhere and you, you run out of electricity? Well, the fact is you're much more likely to find electricity wherever it is that you are rather than a petrol station. So if I broke down here, for example, all I've got to do is try and find an extension cable and then I would be good. However, as Renault don't want to give you one of those cables by default, you're kind of stuck. You would be especially stuck too if your Zoe had been supplied to you by Arnold Clark up in Scotland. My other house grandmother just bought a Zoe and they gave to her with the car no charging cables at all, which I think is rather bad show. So as mentioned, this is the 135 horsepower version of the car, so it's reasonably brisk as a lot of these EVs tend to be once you're at sort of 20 or 30 mile an hour, but it hasn't got the punch of the Leaf or the Kias. For new drivers, this is still more than adequate, and to be honest, you can still have fun with it. Ultimate grip levels seem to be reasonably low, lower again than either Leaf or Kia, and I don't quite have the confidence to push on in the car that I do with either of those. In fact, the Nissan actually is a surprisingly fun car to drive. I really do mean that. I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought that I might. The stereo in here is pretty good. It has the optional Bose setup, which I think is about another 500 pounds, and it's very tolerable. Of course, you have Bluetooth in this top-line car. You've also got wireless phone charging as well, which is a nice little thing to see. The GT line also comes mercifully with electric windows all round, front and rear parking sensors, and even a reversing camera, meaning that it's pretty easy to park it wherever you need to. Also optional is this purple paintwork, which looks fantastic, I have to say. It's pretty dirty today because it's been raining and its owner lives down a farm track. He did actually hand it over to me very clean, so I'm sorry, Edward, that it's coming back quite so dirty, but there's no real way of getting around it on a day like today. Annoying me right about now is the fact that something in the back is rattling. I don't know what it is, but there was nothing in this car earlier and it was still making a racket. I don't think it's the spare seat belt which is held up top because it's not really going to hit anything. But I think it could possibly be the boot floor or maybe even one of the cables under said boot floor. I don't really know why EV manufacturers still insist on putting the cables under the boot floor. That's just a design fail as far as I'm concerned because it means the moment you put anything in your boot, you've got to take it all out to get to the cables or you've got to try and lift the boot up with something heavy in there. And for an older person who can't do that anymore, that just seems silly. Why can't you have special pouches or, or have them hanging from the ceiling or, or just put them anywhere 
except back there. Audi were clever and they put them in the front of the e-tron, which actually is a fairly sensible place because that's where your charging socket is. So having the cables nearby just seems sensible to me. Now I would say in terms of driver involvement, the Zoe is unlikely to win any awards. However, it has won quite a few awards. What car best small electric car, in fact, which it's won something like seven times in a row. Very impressive. Not quite sure how what car make their mind up, and I'm not entirely convinced that there are enough cars in the small electric car category to make it something all that proud of. As with most of these things, below 20 mile an hour, the Zoe will also make an artificial noise which can be changed. I'm waiting for the day that we can press a button and they sound like the cars off the Jetsons. If somebody can do that, I would like them to. Annoyingly, I think the company most likely to do that has got to be Tesla. It, it, it's going to be Tesla, isn't it? In fact, did Tesla already do that? Because I, I can see them doing that. They seem like that sort of company. Yeah, you put your foot down at sort of 35, 40, and the car does respond, but not with the urgency of the sole or the leaf. It's a shame, really. So for us slightly more experienced drivers, if you want a little bit more punch, I would say to go for one of those. Steering is quite direct, although the wheel itself doesn't really give you much in the way of feedback. However, the car and chassis respond quite nicely. Now, it's not the most supple of chassis, although for a small car, it's not bad at all. It's still a reasonably comfortable car, even with these optional 17s on. I'm told they have made the ride just a little bit firmer, but honestly, it's not ruined at all. It's absolutely fine. The main thing that bugs me about the Zoe is for a car which is supposed to be Renault's future, it seems very inconsistent and really that well thought through. For example, there's a huge number of blank buttons in this thing. Now that's partly due to the fact that this higher trim car, which has a larger screen, has functions in the screen, which on the lower trim versions they don't, so they have to be physical buttons. So that means when you get the posh version, you don't need the buttons, so you've just got blanks. That's not right. You buy the posh version and you get the blank buttons. Eh. There's even some blanks on the steering wheel, which is really annoying because you've then got this sort of reasonably cheap stereo control stalk down here, which reminds me a lot of sort of old work vans, that sort of thing. It does feel just a, a little bit off in a car like this. Now, visibility is reasonably good. You've got a nice little quarter light down here, which really helps. B pillar's slightly in the way, which is unfortunate, but out the back you can see, and like I said, you've got plenty of parking aids as well when you're trying to bring the thing to a stop. Now, one item that does annoy me is the gear lever down here, because you see, it's very, very easy indeed to just whack it straight into reverse even if you're still doing some speed. So for example, uh, let's demonstrate. I've got to pull over for a car up here in a moment. So I'm gonna pull over and I'm slowing down. I'm doing now six mile an hour and it'll put itself in reverse. Now you do technically need the brake pedal on to do that, but when you're slowing down, you've probably got the brake pedal on anyway. And I think there should be just another level of control. There should be a button or something that you press to make it just a, a little harder. I only found this out by accident because what I was trying to do earlier was put the thing simply in neutral, which is actually quite difficult because you've got to be really super gentle with it. Otherwise you will just bash straight into reverse. It's a minor thing, but seems worth pointing out because when you are trying to maneuver, I want to know exactly what gear this car's in. Okay, sure, most of the time you're going to be going from drive to reverse and back, but I want just a, a little bit more of a confirmation that that process has happened. It, this, this isn't, I mean, this clearly is not actually connected to anything, but I would just like it to feel more like it is. A tiny thing to complain about? Yes, for sure. But at this kind of price, I think you need to point out these things. After all, they certainly haven't spent too much money on lovely leather in here. In fact, the only leather that's in the car is on the steering wheel and on the seat where you can't see it. There's an eco button down here, which simply ruins the throttle response. The entire time I've been driving the car, I've averaged just under four miles per kilowatt hour, which is pretty much the same as I get in everything else that isn't an e-tron. Trying to make the car trendy and hip, there is actually an app for it as well. 
Unfortunately, it's apparently mostly broken and reasonably useless. There's not a lot you can actually do with it. With the old app, apparently you could unlock and start the car and do various different things, but the new one, apparently you can't. You can turn the lights on though, and I think you might be able to also get the car to warm itself up. Very nice and handy for a crisp winter's morning. Other than that, really particularly useful. In fact, the key is also a very silly design. It's this little key card type thing, which Renault have become very fond of. And it's stupid because you need to use it because it's got buttons and things on it. This isn't a full keyless system at all. And it's very awkward. There's, there's nowhere to put it. There's nowhere to slot it inside the car. No, no, no. There's not, I've checked. It's just a, a little bit of a design fail. Renault seem obsessed with the key card idea. Uh, we are, by the way, driving through Lavender very beautiful village here in a leafy Suffolk in England and it's home to the second most photographed door in the country. One of the houses along here was I think the model for Harry Potter's parents houses in the film. In case you were wondering the first most photographed door is number 10 Downing Street. The Zoe, as you can probably tell, is a car that doesn't really make me feel anything in any particular way. However, there is some good news if you are considering one. Where Tesla and many of Renault's rivals are outright refusing to put even a penny worth of discount on their electric lineup, Renault are quite keen to shift these. So this top spec car was had for far less than £30,000. In fact, think closer to about 28 and you're on the money. That means you can have one of these, what Renault claim they'll sell the base model for. That's more like it. And I've heard stories that if you find the right dealer at the right moment and you're prepared to haggle a little bit, an entry level Zoe, entry level, is around 20,000 of your earth pounds. And that, is actually a price that I think begins to make sense. Finally, an electric car that actually I could say to people, yes, there is a reason to buy this car. You have a remote chance, a hope in Hades' own back garden of recouping some of your costs. I do not have anywhere near the scientific credentials to be able to tell you whether purchasing one of these is actually doing Polar Pete, the angry bear, any favors, but I think in truth, the vast majority of customers are actually motivated by price. Recently, governments, including our own and many others, have had a policy, I think, which has been all stick and no carrot with regards to electric cars. They've simply been trying to punish everybody that wants to buy a fossil fuel vehicle and not really given us many reasons to actually want an electric one because they're still really, really ruddy expensive. And with government subsidies being diminished, it's not really helping. I hope that with the next generation of these cars, we can see all of the numbers go up, with the exception of price, which will then hopefully be able to come down. I know Lotus have just been given a load of money by the British government, and I hope they're not intending on seeing any of that again, but the aim of that is to help make the electric cars somewhat lighter. You make them lighter, you make them more efficient, which means batteries can be smaller, which means they can be cheaper, and they'll be less like that, a little more like this, and hopefully, actually, they will become the genuinely accessible and affordable car for the masses that every Tesla Model S ludicrous owner thinks they already are. Because I can tell you, right now, right here, 2020, they are not a sensible option for Joe Bloggs. The Zoe, at the present time, is probably the car which can make the best claim for being that. I have yet to try the MG ZS EV, but ask yourself, do you want an MG ZS EV? Exactly. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed watching. A huge thank you to Edward for lending me his car. Sorry it's coming back so dirty. Thanks to you all for watching. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.